Welcome to the Wasika Small Town Big Stories podcast, brought to you by Bird's Eye Foods and iTron. I'm your host, Ann Fitch, the Executive Director of the Wasika Area Chamber of Commerce, where we promote business and enhance community. Today, I'm joined at the Suburban Furniture Table with Anna Pollock, the Executive Director of the Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council. Welcome, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, I'm excited to have you here. Now, you are very new to this position. Yes, I'm only about three and a half weeks in, so still very new. Um, But I'm happy to be here, happy to talk a little bit about Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council. Now, tell us a little bit about your journey to this position. Uh, You are from Waseca originally. I sure am, yeah. Um, It is so winding, I would say, my journey to this position. Um, So I grew up in Waseca, was really active in the choirs, uh, in show choir, all that good stuff. I was in band for a couple of years. Um, and then really just fa- fell in love with writing and singing music, or I guess writing my own songs and singing my own songs. Um, was involved in 4-H, would perform on 4-H stages across <laughs> uh, southern Minnesota and at the state fair a couple of times. And um, decided to go on into this kind of music journey career uh, at McNally Smith College of Music, music hmm. which is now defunct, but um, graduated with a music business degree and a, a minor in songwriting and composition. So From the beginning, arts were always a really big um, kind of part of my life. And so after that, spent a couple of years out of state. I was in L.A. working in the industry for for two years. Uh, Got a very concentrated experience of what it was to work in the music industry. Uh, Kind of saw the the hood of the beast and um, decided to come back to Minnesota. I really missed it. I was spending too much money on plane tickets back home. And so uh, I moved back to Minnesota uh, and started working at different media companies up in the Twin Cities. The first was radio. I was working at WCC Radio and Jack FM for a couple of years and then transitioned to print. So if you're keeping track, TV, radio, and then print. And uh, print only lasted a couple of months because I was really drawn to Waseca. I was really missing home. And um, there was an organization called Lead for Minnesota that was headquartered in Waseca. And I learned a little bit about their mission and what they were doing. And lo and behold, they had their headquarters, like I said, in Waseca. And I decided... I'm going to make a jump into the nonprofit world because print, the print world was dying off too quickly, you know, and so nonprofits um, just famously uh, <laughs> were so much more, um, I don't know, hard, I guess, to, to break into. And so started working at Lead for Minnesota in, uh, in February of 2020, four weeks before the pandemic. Um, and then, yeah, and uh, then got swept under in, in um, the shutdown and started working for them for... I was there for two and a half years, um, and that was a program that really uh, did a lot of work across the state for community development and rural revitalization, which were two things that I really just completely latched on to and ran with. It was, you know, the cliche of like, I felt like it was kind of my calling now. I was like, oh my gosh, this is it. This is what I want to do. And so while I was there, um, I really learned the landscape of nonprofits across the state. Um, I learned what communities were doing all the way from... Um, Winona to War Road, and um, yeah, I just really fell in love with Minnesota again, even though I fell in love with it enough to move back. And so uh, I was there for, uh, like I said, two and a half years. Then last summer, I took a step away from them, um, away from full-time work, and uh, in, in December of 2021, started directing high school theater in Waseca, and fell in love with that, um, and just really just I don't know, just dive back into the community. Um, from there, I was asked to be on a couple of boards and um, learned a little bit of what it takes to have a nonprofit and be a part of a nonprofit, even more so than I went when I was at Lead for Minnesota. And an opportunity popped up uh, that their executive director had um, since moved on, and I didn't even know, I, I knew nothing about the Regional Arts Council space, but um, I, I am such an advocate for this region. I'm an advocate for arts and then it kind of just fell into place. And so, yeah, I started, that was, like I said, a little winding path to where I am now, but started about three weeks ago and and it's been a lot of fun. There are a whole lot of things in that journey that I'm going to ask you about. (laughs) So first of all is 4-H, because I think that that's just an amazing program, Mm -hmm. especially in our area. Uh, Talk about some of the things in 4-H that you loved and some of those skills that they taught you. Oh yeah. Okay. So I would say one of my favorite 
parts of 4-H um, when I was growing up. And I'm going to caveat this and say I was a 4-H member in Steele County, not Waseca County, which well. I know, wah, wah, but, <laughs> but I did a... I did general projects because I, you know, I have a mom who was a, came from seven generations of farmers and then married an engineer, and so we didn't farm growing up, but uh, we lived on a farm. We lived out in the country, and so all my neighbors did uh, 4-H and showed animals, but I was doing general projects, and I think that is a really important piece with 4-H is that it isn't just for farm kids. It isn't just for people who mm-hmm. have animals. It's for anyone, uh, you know, town kids too. So, um, yeah, I, I was president my sophomore year of high school. I went on to, um, you know, I wanted to be an ambassador, but it didn't work out with my schedules, blah, blah, blah. So I just, yeah, really fell in love with 4-H um, in high school and thought that this, like you said, it was like a leadership experience and a leadership program. Um, I'm like a 4-H evangelist now in, in my like adulthood, I look back at the skills that I had and, um, working with elders, working with youth, working with, um, the community and just getting to know your neighbors in a way that I wouldn't have if I wasn't a part of that organization, going and playing bingo at the nursing home, those kinds of things mm-hmm. that I think, um, you know, some kids are, are, uh, exposed to, but I would never have been exposed to it if I wasn't a part of 4-H. So yeah love 4-H. <laughs> and then I also want you to talk about your time in Los Angeles because mm-hmm. you're certainly not the first kid from the area to go out to LA Yep. and you won't be the last. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so talk about your experience in getting there, being there and your, and your decision to come home. Yeah. Yeah. So when I graduated from McNally, um, I worked with my supervisor, her name is Chelsea. Um, and uh, Chelsea Remiger, if she's out listening to this, I, she knows how much of a mentor she's been my entire career. And I, I truly believe that my career started with her. Um, but when I, I was working for her under the events program at the school, so we did graduations, the ceremony, you know, we kind of did all the events that came through the school. And, um, she had sent a, a note out to her, her kind of contacts when I was done with my, my schooling and said, okay, I have this student worker. She wants to work on either coasts or Minnesota or in Minneapolis. Um, and the first person to, uh, to bite was the Grammy Foundation, which is housed under um, the Recording Academy, so the Grammys. And, um, and I, I worked with them because for some fluke reason, in the summer of 2014, uh, McNally had gotten a grant through, I believe, Target, and um, fundraised to have Grammy Camp come through McNally. And Grammy Camp is also a bit different than it was um, back then. Back then, it was um, a, like a week-long camp they had in Nashville, New York, and L.A., and then that one year in St. Paul. Um, and so when they came through McNally, I was their point person because I was the, you know, the worker for our, our event department. So I was booking their hotel rooms, helping them with kind of tourist destinations in Minneapolis. I think that weekend was like Rock the Garden or something. Also defunct, like how sad. Anyway, um, and so... So anyway, they were the first person that responded and were like, yeah, we have this position open for um, a administrative assistant temp at um, the Grammy camp that we do. And and it's a temp position and, you know, whatever. So since I was so excited to get out of Minnesota, that was, you know, kind of the the one that I took and and interviewed, got the job over the phone. Like I didn't even go to L.A. It was not even it was just it felt like it all happened very quickly. Um, but that was in December when I graduated and then, cause I graduated in the fall and then I didn't move there until March. So when I first moved there, um, yeah, it was, I, I knew no one other than my team that I was working with at, at the Grammys at, um, the foundation and the Grammys have two separate foundations. One of them is an education initiative. It's kind of paired now with their Grammy museum. And then the other one is music cares and music cares is, is I'm going to say a little bit similar to Prairie Lakes because their tagline is that artists can keep making art, whether that means their um, apartment burned down and all their instruments got ruined, uh, whether that Mm. means that they were in a car accident and their band equipment when they were on tour uh, went went up in flames or whatever, Um, flooding, any kind of disasters that happen are just unexpected. A lot of it was rehab too, uh, artists who had to go to rehab and, and had to cover the costs. And um, after my temp position at the Grammy camp, at their education initiative, um, they had a, a temp position open up at Music Cares as well in their events department, which is my background. And so, yeah, so I worked there. That got me through a show. I got to go to like adult prom. That's what I always say the Grammys <laughs> are. Um, it it's truly feels like adult prom. And um, So you went to the Grammys? I did go to the Grammys. That yeah. is really cool. Yeah, I got to take my parents. It was great. Now, um, how far <laughs> back did you have to sit? 
<laughs> I wasn't even sitting anywhere. I was backstage, actually. Oh I was, my yeah. gosh! I was backstage. I was like, asking. I was asking artists uh, for autographs because that's how Music Cares funds a lot of their programming. Is they get um, these kinds of items like. Like one of them, I had to ask Selena Gomez to sign her album cover, her whatever vinyl thing, or like my who, one of my who, favorite. Yeah, who was nice? Oh, uh, well, Tori Kelly was like so sweet. She came up to me and was like, "Your dress is so pretty." I was like, "You're so pretty. I love your work." Blah blah blah. So I mean, she was great. Selena Gomez was very sweet too. Um, but my favorite, <laughs> my favorite memory was, um, and I was like, you know, the the temp. I was not. They would let me go and ask people, especially. This is gonna sound so weird, man. I'm gonna have to cut this, but. Like Selena's album cover was like of her nude on a beach, but like covered up. And sure. the guy was like, can you ask her for the signature? Like, I feel weird asking her to sign. Like, sure. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so there were a few that they were like, can you ask these people? And Beyonce comes through, right? Beyonce Get comes out. Through. And, and I'm like, do you want, like, cause I'm at that point, I was at that point where I was like, it doesn't phase me anymore. It just doesn't. I don't get starstruck anymore. They're just people. And uh, and so I was like asking my coworker, like, do you want me to ask her this or whatever? Do you feel comfortable? He goes, uh, it's it's like the queen. I got this, you know, whatever. She proceeds to walk, like walk past us. He goes, he froze. And, and I am like, do, do you want this? <laughs> It was, it's, you know, funny stories of like working backstage, but yeah, that was it. So I got, so he froze at the queen bee. He froze at the queen bee. You yep, know, I some know. guys just can't handle it around the queen. Some guys can't. Um, and he couldn't. And so, <laughs> yeah. So he missed out on getting the queen bees sure autograph. Did. What yeah, a sure dip. Did. I so know. So music cares. Music cares. Missed out <laughs> on getting the queen bees. I love that. Yeah. Because <laughs> this guy fanboyed out yeah. on yep. the queen. But the temp, you know, the temp could have handled it. Yeah, but the it, temp could have handled temp it. Do it. Anyway, so unreal, <laughs> unreal. So when that temp position was up, um, I had so the executive office at the Recording Academy at that time was Neil Port now, and um, they had been uh, they had a high turnover position in there, and so their HR uh, the HR department just contacted me and said we have a position open. We we want you to stay. Like we don't want you to leave. And so would you be interested in this? knowing the context. And I said, I'm up for the challenge. Sure. That sounds good. Um, but you know, I kind of just didn't even have like, cause I, at that point was ready to get out of the industry all, at, already at that mm -hmm. point. Um, but I was like, well, if it pays better, you know, whatever. So I worked in the executive office with, um, the president and CEO of the Grammys for nine months, <laughs> which was three months longer than anyone had lasted in the last four years at that position. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, and after nine months, uh, had a pause in my career, AKA got let go in a weird <laughs> way, super weird way. But you and lasted longer than anyone else. I up did. To that point. Yeah. So that's I what think I can tell people. Big feather in your cap. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so I, I left that job uh, in December of like 2017 and there was about a two month period that I was like, I'm gonna make it work. Like I'm gonna try and find positions. Um, and I was really only getting interviews at positions that were like half the salary that I was at, like mm. truly unlivable. And I get to this point where I'm like, okay, you can be in a position that is like really tough. You can try and make it work in a place you really don't have a lot of connection to, or you could also be like miserable looking for work in a place that like a lot of people love you. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so, cause yeah. I, at the end of the day, I needed a job. And so I was like, I don't know why I'm making it harder on myself. Like truly there were points, um, where I remember like being in my apartment, looking across the street, like a Bristol farms, which is like a LA version of whole foods and thinking I could bag groceries for a little bit. Like they pay well. Like I, you know, it just, and I feel like I would have sacrificed my career in the name of my career, which just felt so weird. And so, yeah, so I decided in February, and it was um, almost to the exact day two years later that I moved back to Minnesota. And so for a while, um, you know, I think there's like a lot of that tail between your legs moment of like, oh, I couldn't make it work. Um, but I think the, the more like, you know, nuanced story and the more accurate story is that um, – I made it work a little too long. Like I, I mm -hmm. really made it work and I, I believe that I, I made it work out in LA. Um, but it was an area that, um, shifted my priorities. Like truly, I felt like I had different priorities when I was there and those priorities didn't align with who I, who I wanted to be. They just aligned with what was all around me. Right. Um, I, I like, I believe that we're 
creatures of our surroundings that we can like stoop really low or go really high depending on who's around us. And I was in a position that like, yeah, I was starting to like suck the humanity out of me in a way that I like was starting to just feel competitive with people on the street. And it's like, whoo, I know that's like not me. I'm not mm-hmm. a competitive person. And, um, and that was like my, yeah, one of my big deciding factors. Yeah. So you just kind of saw it changing you and you didn't want it to change you any further. Absolutely. So you came home. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. I think that's a fantastic observation <laughs> and that you came home. Yeah. I'm glad I'm back. <laughs> yeah. So you're home. Mm-hmm. You're the new executive director of the Prairie Lakes, Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council. Mm-hmm. Now here's the question that I think a lot of people want an answer to. Okay. What do they do? Ooh. <laughs> and I know you're new. <laughs> So I'm going to give you some grace in this answer. There's, there's ways that I could say it because, you know, all in all, Prairie Lakes is there to steward money to artists in the region. That's mm-hmm. like what we are. Our mission statement, though, I do want to get this right, yes. is that uh, Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council serves the artistic communities of the nine county area of South Central Minnesota by supporting the creation and presentation of diverse art forms, fostering equitable access to arts opportunities and integrating arts and culture to enhance, enhance quality of life in our communities. So yeah, all in all, it's uh, we uh, receive money from the state and the McKnight Foundation, mm-hmm. and um, we you know get to decide who in our region gets that money. The, the really beautiful part is that, uh, I'll tell you right now for people listening, if you're applying for grants, um, the funding is there. We want you to apply. It's it's not a, a scarcity mindset of, um, you know, we only give grants out to three people a year. I think, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, of course, because I'm so new, but right. um, we give uh, about... 66% of our um, our budget is to our grants. It goes directly back into artists' hands or arts organization hands. And this year, um, our operating budget is about $945,000. So okay. if you can imagine, um, you know, about a little over $500,000 going straight back into the arts in South Central Minnesota. And so if, uh, let's say, Wasika Art Center or even mm-hmm. Wasika Schools um, needed something for a project that's revolving around arts. And it's just not just about painting. It's it could be about vocal drama, visual mm-hmm. arts, literary graphic yeah. design. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Literal arts. Those are all things that they could apply for grants for through Prairie Lakes regional arts. Absolutely. Yep. So we have to, you know, a couple different kinds of grants, but, uh, we have artist grants that go again, directly to artists. We also have art organization grants. Mm-hmm. So that means you have to have a 501 C three in order to apply for them. You can use a fiscal agent. If you have someone who has, you know, a 501c3 status, um, but you're an org that doesn't have that yet. So yeah, there are just so many great opportunities and it's kind of that's that, um, what I, what I've envisioned the, the racks, the regional arts councils, cause there are 11 across the state, um, is that we are that stepping stone between state funding. So state arts board grants, I think they're like their limitations or eligibility for operating funds has to be over like $175,000 a year in order to get a grant from them. Mm-hmm. But we're working with people who don't have that kind of a budget, right? Your budget could be zero. Your but I mean that sometimes this is like their first grant that they're applying for, their first kind of entry into the grant system. And so, yeah, that's what makes them so important to the region is that we are working with people uh, you know, with zero budgets, upwards of people, I think we have a, a few, like 5% of our grants go to um, organizations that have an over $150,000 budget. And so we're anything in between, but um, for, like I said, a lot of people, it's their first entry point into writing a grant for their organization or for their art, which is huge for emerging artists. So mm-hmm. for, <clears throat> for an individual artist to get a grant, what what do what would they have to do? Let's say you had um, a band mm-hmm. like uh, like a, uh, a regional band like Angry Waters. Mm-hmm. They needed to buy uh, new sound equipment mm-hmm. or something like that. Is that something they could apply for a grant for? Or how do how do how does an how does an individual artist get? Right. Get a grant. A lot of it is project based. So that could be for a project, right? We need a new soundboard because of this, you know, we're going on tour or we have to do this or whatever. And so a lot of it is project based. Um, and yeah, and that's, yeah, we, it, we fund, like I said, artists and the, the projects are also like for organizations too. So if an organization has a specific project that they have to apply for, they can apply for that too. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think mm-hmm. there's a lot of uh, misconceptions about who can apply, who can apply for a grant and what the uses are. They think, yeah. Oh, it can only be the art center. 
They're oh, the yeah, only no. ones that can apply mm-hmm, for a grant. Mm-hmm. I, as a as a as a painter or a graphic designer, I just can't do it. Yeah, we actually have two different um, grants that go directly to art artists, and that um, one of them is an emerging artist grant, which those are people who are new to the career, first time applying to you know those kind of people. We also have mid career grants too, and those are for folks who maybe they've had a few gallery shows, maybe they've had uh, you know been on the scene for a little bit. So yeah, we even have kind of two different forms of, of grants that can go directly to people. Awesome. And I just, I do want to, uh, point out, cause I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, what you've done for the local art community <laughs> in, um, in the way of drama in, in Waseca. And you've put on a few successful plays here <laughs> at Waseca high school, um, namely Mama Mia and Legally Blonde and Little Women. <clears throat> Those have been three of my favorites. Yeah, and you, you want to talk about just kind of the resurgence in, in the drama department yeah. here at Waseca. Yeah. Um, I feel like this is like where my face completely lights up because it's just, it's my favorite thing that I do. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, it takes me back to high school when I was in drama and it always... Um, it always kind of felt like we had the cake, we had the drama department, but we could never really like reach it or we never could eat it. Right. We had the cake, we couldn't eat it. And, um, and we, we put on really fun shows. I was in a production of Grease, you know, we, we, it was fun. Um, but they're just, you know, we had the auditorium at central building and, um, while that's a beautiful venue, Mm -hmm. it's incomparable to the performing arts center that we have now. And so, Now that we have, it feels like we have a whole piece of cake instead of a pie. (laughs) We have a complete (laughs) cake, three tiers, frosting, everything. Um, I wanted the, I wanted to be able to like have the kids really dig into it and, and really, um, yeah, just, just, it it almost feels like a healing of an inner child in myself. Um, and so when I got there, I, I only, I started on a one act in, uh, December of 2021, January 22. And uh, that was, you know, a 25 minute show. It was Rapunzel uncut. It was a very, mm-hmm. you know, silly uh, alternative telling of a fairy tale. And um, uh, that's all I really thought I was going to do. I thought, I kind of thought it was just going to be like a one and done. And oh no. I know, oh no. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and so, so after I did that, and, and I will say this, I'm going to quote one of the students when I came in to do that job. Again, no, no kind of thoughts that I would is going to be doing it past this one show. But my first day when I had this like informational meeting about the one act, I had one of the kids raise his hand and go, "Are, are you our new director forever, or just for this show?" And in my, I remember answering him like, "Well, for now, it's just this show, but I, I might be around." You know, I didn't know, and I think that question stuck with me as I was doing the show because. I think what the kids really needed it was like just this consistency. I even mm-hmm. remember when I was in high school, whether this was true or if something was happening around, you know, back scenes or whatever. But I remember in my high school career of, of drama, um, sometimes we didn't know who was directing the fall show. Sometimes we didn't know who was directing the spring show. Was it going to be, uh, you know, I always like think about um, Karen Farr Anderson. She was my uh, my director when I was in one act in high school. And I always thought like, oh, is she going to do the fall play? Oh, no, she just does one actor, you know, whatever. Right, so right. I think the kids just kind of needed this consistency. And so it was like before our performances of Rapunzel Uncut and uh, Dr. Jason Miller brought me into his office and was like, would you be willing to do the musical? <laughs> <He> said, <laughs> it's like going from a 25 minute show to a full length two hour musical. I, I think at that point I had already gotten the bug and I was like, okay, sure. Like, let's, let's do it. Well, why not? So I spoke with the band director, Devin Lawrence, and it was like, okay. I, I remember like the meeting so clearly. It was me, him, um, the former Wasika choir director, and then my dad, who was doing uh, the tech behind everything, and then Karen Farr Anderson. And we all sat at a table, and I had three shows in mind. And um, I, I kind of can't remember them now, unfortunately. I, I probably should pull them up. But two of them were unknown, were like not mm-hmm. well known shows, sure. right? Like just from a, uh, you know, a, 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 a script place online, whatever. And then the third one was legally blonde. And I just remember kind of unveiling it and Karen, Karen's eyes just going, Oh, like, Oh really? Is this one of the options? And so I said, I, when I presented it to them though, I said, it's the junior version. So that meant that it was backing tracks. It Mm -hmm. was a 90 minute show. Um, and it was like the junior versions are kind of more geared toward middle school. So like sixth through eighth graders. And I laid all that out there and Devin kind of was just sitting there and he's like, you know, I think we could do, I think we could do the full show. And everyone kind of was like, 
maybe like uh, I don't know and so I said okay I'll look at it I'll look at the script I'll look at you know the differences whatever and it was clear to me too like okay if we were to do the junior version it would be like punching down it would be it would be Mm -hmm. kind of like not doing it big so I emailed Mr. Lawrence Devin and I was like okay like obviously this is going to be your call because you're the band director you're going to be the one directing the pit if right. we do the full version, what do you think? And he said, go big or go home. And we have lived by those words ever since. And so it was just so fun. I think there was like something really sparkly and magical about Legally Blonde um, that even like, even with the success of Mamma Mia, um, didn't, it, it, it's hard to compare the two because Legally Blonde, like I was so emotional at that show. I could even get emotional now about it, but it's, it was just really one of those moments where I felt like we all leaned into it and we all, none of us, none of us had that mentality of, well, we're just Wasika. Like, right. Let's not like, it doesn't have to be that good. We all were like, this is going to be the best dang thing we do this year. And the kids hadn't had a musical yet. All of my, all of the high schoolers that were a part of that show had never been in a musical before and it just was one of those, yeah, one of those like special moments that everything kind of came together and it was a lot of work, but it mm-hmm. also like came together in a way that was so magical for the kids. Um, and I, I still get like comments from the kids of like, that was the best like experience of my high school career. Well, I forgot I was watching high school kids for yeah. a while. Like yeah. it was, it was so talented, it was so, talented mm-hmm. so many talented kids. It was so well done. Yeah. And <clears throat> I will say as an adult in the community, especially someone who does not have kids, I enjoyed a little spicier yeah. play yeah. that was not so um, child driven, yeah. I guess. Yes. Like, even yeah. though, like, these are 16, 17, 18 year olds. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I think that they've some, heard it all before. <laughs> they've, yes, they've heard it all before. They've said it all before. Yep. Um, and it was not overly adult, mm-hmm. um, but it was, I think it was age appropriate for those for the actors yeah. and definitely age appropriate for the audience. Um, mm-hmm. then, and this was not something you were bringing your second grader to. Yeah. Um, yep. and of course you do mix it up with the upcoming musical for yeah. this year and you give, give the elementary school students a chance to come and enjoy something as well from time to time. But I, I enjoy that you, you, you take the time to be thoughtful in what you're choosing and, yeah. and give something for everyone in the community, which is fantastic. And Mama Mia was just it was so good, and the talent was off the charts. Oh, they're so talented. And Mamma Mia, I, you know, I tell the kids I have, like, my favorite shows that I will always want to direct, and Mamma Mia was one of them. I would say it's, like, my it, – in, in the lineup of, like, the shows that I want to direct, it's number two. And so I was so excited um, to direct it, and the songs are my favorite songs. The, uh, the characters are my favorite characters. They're just so wonderful, and so we had a lot of, a lot of fun with it. But you're right, yeah, next year we'll be doing Beauty and the Beast – and so that's geared towards a younger audience mm-hmm. and, um, we're hoping to, you know, make it as bigger and better and just, we're going big again. Big we're like already sets. in conversations with partnering with like orchestras and, um, getting costume designs mm-hmm. already figured out. And it just feels like a beast, not a pun, mm-hmm. but it feels like a beast every single year. And Mamma Mia, we started earlier than we did with Legally Blonde because Legally Blonde was truly like two weeks before rehearsals. I was like, oh, I'm doing this? Okay. Um, but with, <laughs> with Mamma Mia, it just felt like a really, like, uh, yeah, just kind of the whole year felt like we were gearing up for it. And now with Beauty and the Beast, like, I think that's even going to be be more so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because I mean, a musical is very expensive to put on as it well. It sure is. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But they're a lot of fun. Yeah, they're a lot of fun. They bring, uh, again, the Legally Blonde, I just think back to like how the community got brought together for that. We do playbills um, for the shows, which again was one of those like have your cake and eat it too for the kids. I wanted them to, f- to see their name in a real playbill. Um, and so we, you know, get got rights from playbill and, and all that good stuff. And um, I went back to the uh, people who had purchased ads in the community, different members um, of the community, the businesses. And I went back and like handed it to them and said, thank you. And, and they all were just like, oh my gosh, everyone's talking about this. Like I, and even if they had gone, even if they hadn't gone, mm-hmm. they were like, oh my gosh, I've heard so much about this. I think it was just kind of like, um, like a wake up call to Wasika of like, we have this space, you guys bought it. Like yes. we need to use it. We need to make sure we stuff it full of really good shows. <laughs> yes. I totally agree. I think after Legally Blonde, 
there was a lot of talk about the great musical and people were not going to miss Mamma Mia. Yeah. 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 And they didn't, we did, we had great turnouts. Yes. Mia, fantastic so. mm-hmm. turnout. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm really excited that you are the new executive director of the Prairie Lakes mm-hmm. Regional Arts Council. I think you're going to be fantastic in that role. And I think you're going to be doing that as long as you want to do that. Thank you. Yes. I, I hope to also be doing it as long as I want to do it. Yes. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And if you can maybe get Beyonce here, yeah, you know, yeah. as just if, like, a whatever. No one fumbles. Yeah. Yep. yep. We're not going to put that other guy in charge of getting no. her here because he's going to fanboy out about it and he'll right. never get the job done. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, before we wrap up, mm-hmm. I just have uh, one question for you. Would you rather act in a play, direct it, or watch it? Direct. 1,000%. Okay, so here's the thing about me. <sighs> I feel like this is really outing me right now, but I actually don't enjoy going to theater. <laughs> what? <laughs> I know, I know. It's awful. Uh, because I'd rather be a part of it or I'd rather be directing it. Uh, I don't act anymore because... It's like hard to even call it stage fright. It's truly just like this point where I'm like, no, I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to memorize the lines. I don't want to be held accountable. I don't want to be up on stage. But um, directing is just like this this new-ish, right, in the last couple of years um, niche that I've found that I'm like, oh, that's exactly where I want to be. I think it's also when I think about my time at McNally Smith, I like lived with X's on my hands because I was working Mm. so many shows and I was was under 21. And so um, I, I think I just kind of found out that I... 100% 100% of the time, rather be working a show than attending a show. And that's even true for like my favorite musical artists. Like I just wouldn't go and see them in a concert anymore because in my head I'm like, what's backstage looking like? Is the green room set up well? You know, like I just kind of think about it yeah. all the time now where I'm like, what's, what's going on backstage? I want to know. Right. That's seeped into every other part of my life too, where I'm like, how does that work? Oh, what's that going on? So as a director, it's really fun that, you know, you ask me anything about a show and I'll be like, here's how this was set up. We had all 12 mics lit up on that, you know, for Mamma Mia. We had this going on. We had that, you know, so it's, it's just fun. It's so fun to like put it all together and see how it works. Mm-hmm. There it is. Directing is where Anna's heart is. Absolutely. Call me executive director. (laughs) Boom. (laughs) Nick, can you just fit this part in somewhere? Now, Anna, I understand that you wrote a book that is out. Are we really going to talk about that? Yeah, we are going to talk about this. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Anyway, let's talk talk about your book. Okay, let's talk about the book. What's up? (laughs) You tell me. You tell me. I want to. I want to. I want to hear about your. I want to hear about your book. Yeah, that's on. That's for sale currently. It is for sale currently. Yeah, it's for sale currently. Um, yeah. Uh, so during the pandemic, everyone got a new hobby. Probably during the pandemic, right? And mm-hmm. my new hobby was writing. Um, so I got like so inspired by. I'm like doing hot because I don't like talking about this. <laughs> So during the pandemic, um, just really got into like writing and, and was a part of like an online community where um, you just would write and like peers would review it and you'd review their work and all whatever. And um, it was just fun. It was so much fun. And uh, then and I, and I truly started that as like not an outlet to do anything about it. Like I was, you know, reading novels left and right. I was, oh my God, like I was reading so many romance novels. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, so the real, the really, really good book. (laughs) Really good book. Yeah. Contemporary romance. Literary treasure. Yes, it is. And so, so I was getting really into reading and, uh, you know, people who, who knew me or even probably like former teachers just knew that like, I was never a reader awful at reading and I, I truly like attest it this is going to sound so de- self-deprecating but like like my frontal it just like it wasn't developed yet like I would read a book and I'd be like I don't know I don't get it like I just I don't know it just didn't happen until recently where I was starting to read books and like actually had the wherewithal to like analyze them and understand like what the author was trying to do and so that's you know where I was I was like kind of working in this space of like I'm reading so many novels I want to write I want to see if I can emulate that and so um <laughs> last year I, um, I worked at a farm at Cedar Crate Farm Mm -hmm. in, um, in Waldorf, right? And, and, uh, and was like so inspired by the like romantic, romanticism, I guess, of, Mm -hmm. um, like harvesting vegetables with a friend or harvesting vegetables and in like... The romanticism of harvesting vegetables with a friend. (laughs) Okay. I'm all right. I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. 
side note. Falling in Julie, love side note, please take this out of there. No, we're not taking no, any of do. this no, out. No, I went on a date with someone, this was like last year, and he wrote a poetry book called The Romanticism of Wild Blueberries. And I was like, I'm in love with you. When I met him, I was not in love with him. But it's like, there is romanticism. Okay, anyway. But yes, there is this romantic part of being in a vegetable farm and like picking tomatoes and like talking to your coworker and saying like, I'm so excited to go home and make a BLT. And he'd be like, I'm so excited to go home and make some pasta with it. Like it was just this cuteness. Sure. And I loved it. And so um, I drove about 25 minutes back and forth. For, it's very Paul Rudd. Yeah. <laughs> it's very Paul Rudd movie. Yes. <laughs> And so I was just thinking of like how cute it is that I get to go on like a farm. I go to a farm. I get to like pick vegetables. I get to take vegetables home. I get to cook them. Like it just was so, it was just great. And so, and I'm, I'm so obsessed with food. Like I'm, you know, I hate saying like I'm a foodie because it just feels ridiculous, but like I am. And so anyway, so on this drive back and forth, because it was about 30 minutes away from my house, like I, on this drive back and forth, I was just thinking of these characters of like how fun it would be to write a little romance novel set in a produce farm. I love it. <laughs> so, so that's what I did. And so I <laughs> saw it's a romance novel set in, a, in, set in Meriden, so uh, Steele County, but Wasika, you know, is mm-hmm, a mm-hmm. township. And so... Yeah, it's about, you know, a girl who is working on a produce farm and a uh, city boy from New York who comes in and, and is doing research. He's like, a, and this, another thing like with the book, it's like as if the um, egg school in Wasika were still around, mm-hmm. you know, because there's like a, a college in town that he has to work at and does his research. And so he comes <clears throat> from New York, goes to Meriden, and goes on this produce farm to do research on like um, heirloom varieties of vegetables and whatnot. And so then a, a blooming romance happens because small town, you know, farm girl meets city New Yorker. I love it. And uh, yeah, and it's what's just the like, title? <laughs> when the summer is over. <laughs> I love it. And what, what's special about it? I will say this, and if I do get to plug it, I'm going to plug the fact yes. that. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a rural romance, right? It's set in a small town, but I, it is very much not a Hallmark movie. Um, it is a diverse cast of characters. It is LGBT friendly, um, has a lot of LGBTQIA themes throughout it, um, and talks a little bit about the immigrant kind of uh, story of what it means to be Vietnamese or Hmong in Minnesota in a small town. It's, uh, I have to talk about the story that really inspired um, some of the characters. One of my best friends, uh, her name is Lee Wen, um, and she... Grew up in Mankato, and her family um, would grow bitter melon every summer because they couldn't find bitter melon at the at the supermarket. Right? They couldn't mm-hmm. find it at High V. Um, yet that was really important. Um, That's a very very yep. uh, heavily used <clears throat> yep. uh, piece of produce in, in Vietnamese. Cooking. Absolutely, and and I just when I heard that story when she told me that a I bought bitter means bitter melon seeds that day and like started growing them in my farms for her or my like you know little garden. They didn't do well. I didn't do a very good job growing them, but <laughs> I grew them and um, said to her, like, that is the, the story, like, that is the immigrant story mm-hmm. of being in Minnesota. Um, I think of all the Hmong farmers that enrich our communities so much across mm-hmm. the state and our, they enrich our farmers markets. We are absolutely better off because of them. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to incorporate that in the story because that was a really big part um, for me. So one of the families in the story is um, Vietnamese Hmong and uh, their son Felix is a really big part of the story and is also LGBT and yeah. So it's just one of those, like, I wanna break r- rural stereotypes while also addressing the fact that like, like we're here um, and you know, rural isn't a monolith and yeah. Yeah, it's a fun, on top of it, it's a fun little romance novel. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> I think it's really cool that you wrote a book. Thanks. I'm going to write more. Don't worry. It's a little bug now. <laughs> so. And where can people buy your book? Um, so in person to get a dollar, a dollar off and um, to support local business, Little Professor in Oatana is housing copies. Um, otherwise, if people would like to purchase them online, they are available on Amazon. Okay, very cool. Thanks. Awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you for joining me here today, Anna. This has been fantastic. Thank you. Thank loved, you, Anna. Loved getting to know more about you and the Prairie Lakes Regional Arts Council. Thank you to our sponsor, Bird's Eye Foods and iTron. They make it possible to share the big stories of our small town. Join us next time for Wasika Small Town Big Stories. <laughs>